On February 17, 1951, a New York City district attorney launched an investigation against the NCAA that would lead to seven men getting arrested, 33 players being exposed for accepting bribes, six of the best college teams in the world getting put under, and 86 college games getting wiped from the history books. The scandal lasted three years. It spread across 17 states, almost destroyed the Kentucky Wildcats franchise, and led to NBA legends that should currently be household names instead getting banned for life. This is that story. Point shaving. It's a simple concept. Gamblers approach athletes on the teams favored to win games, and present them with bribes not to necessarily completely throw the game, but instead to make the game closer than it should be. This influences something known as the point spread. In sports gambling, each game has a projected outcome. For example, let's say that the Lakers are playing the Cavs. The Lakers are projected to win by 20. This is the point spread of the game. The main goal of gamblers in this point shaving scandal was to make sure that the teams favored to win would not make the spread, meaning that if they were projected to win by 10, they wanted to make sure that that team did not win by either 10 points or more. And so, the gamblers would tell the players, hey, win by only 5 points instead of 10, miss a couple shots if you have to, make some turnovers, just do whatever you have to do. Then, they would bet against the favored team they just bribed, but since that team would never make the spread, the gamblers would always still end up with a profit. And so, the bribing began. Basketball was written in capital letters by the Beavers of City College. The speedy, sharpshooting Cagers from New York sent the blood pressure of their fans soaring as they swept to victory over the top teams of the nation. The Beavers won the National Invitation Tournament, the National Collegiates, to hit a jackpot unprecedented in basketball. It all started in 1947, and mainly revolved around a college team known as the CCNY Beavers. The Beavers played almost all their games at Madison Square Garden, the mecca, and were the biggest and most dominant team in college basketball. They were so big that the Knicks were seen as a side attraction in comparison to them. Beaver games usually had crowds of around 18,000 people, while the Knicks could only fill around seven or 8,000 seats. This team was massive. At the time, New York's gambling scene was exploding. Around $3.4 million were being bet on every single Beaver game, if you take into account inflation. At the center of the MSG gambling scene was a man by the name of Harry Gross, who earned an inflated adjusted $200 million off of sports gambling. He paid off the entire police department as well as politicians alike, just so he could get away with his crimes, and eventually he would set his sights on the vulnerable, unpaid college athletes. He approached the Beavers' best players and offered them ungodly amounts of money, with only one simple request. Start winning games by just a little bit less. That's all. The bribes they were being handed would supply these players, who were almost all working minimum wage jobs, with almost as much money as a year's worth of work would've. They couldn't say no. And so, the gamblers got richer and richer and richer. Eventually, Gross and his team widened their view. From 1947 to 1950, they reached out to seven of the most dominant college teams in the country, and bribed all of their best players as well. Nobody could turn it down. 
New York University, Long Island University, Manhattan College, Bradley University, the University of Toledo, and the highly acclaimed University of Kentucky. These were all the colleges hit by Gross's bribes. With the police on their side and all the best players in the world collectively faking their games, nothing could have gone wrong. Junius Kellogg, the star center of Manhattan College, looked like just another easy target. The gamblers approached him with $11,300, and in return, all they wanted him to do was point shave in just one game against DePaul University. Kellogg thought long and hard about the offer. He worked minimum wage at a frozen custard shop, but if he developed a relationship with these gamblers and accepted bribes like this one for every single game of the season, he could make almost $250,000 in just that season alone, it would be the easiest money he would ever make. At first, Kellogg accepted. It was just too much money to turn down. But the decision tore at him for the next few days until he drove himself crazy. And so, he couldn't help but tell his coach about the bribe. Shocked and disgusted, his coach sent him off to meet with District Attorney Miles McDonald. And thus, an investigation of the century was launched. McDonald was new to the scene. He had just gotten the job and was slapped in the face with the reality that there was just so much corruption between the police and the gamblers. He had heard stories of a mysterious figure that the streets called Mr. G, but nobody knew his face or full name. McDonald had been conducting a secret investigation to try to expose the gamblers, but he had nothing but mere suspicion to back up his claims. That was until he met up with Junius Kellogg. Kellogg spilled everything to McDonald. Finally, the attorney had what he needed to seal this case. He planted a wire onto Kellogg and sent him off to meet with the gamblers once more. The big man came back with everything on tape. And then comes the night of February 17th, 1951. The day everything would be shut down once and for all. The unsuspecting CCNY Beavers roster got off a train after a game against Temple, only to be swarmed by detectives and led out into the room of the district attorney. McDonald didn't let them leave for hours. He spoke with them all night long until one by one, the players confessed everything. Interrogated them probably from 11 o'clock till finally about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. They, had, they admitted that uh, they had fixed this one game with Loyola. And I mean, you're talking about shock. Seven of the men were arrested. The rest were never going to play any form of professional basketball ever again. McDonald learned that the infamous Mr. G he had heard of was Harry Gross himself, who was also thrown into prison as a result of orchestrating everything. Bookmaker Harry Gross, key witness in the graft case against 18 New York policemen, gets found after getting lost. Gross, reputed head of a $20 million a year bookie empire, slipped away from his blue ribbon guards for a little fun. With Gross under wraps again after causing headlines, McDonald, back in Brooklyn, proceeds with his case against the 18 cops, who he says have accepted a million dollars yearly graft from the bookmaker. The detectives traveled across the country, going team by team, and conducted the same process. By the end of it all, 32 players were caught being bribed to purposely play poorly in a grand total of 86 games. A few months later, they would learn that Jack Molinas, a then NBA All-Star, had also been involved in the scandal, bringing the number of total players involved to 33. And if I ever hear of you playing in a pickup basketball game at the YMCA, much less an organized game of basketball, said, I'll bring you back and I'll put you on Rikers Island and you'll do three years hard time. 
The punishments that the NBA and NCAA inflicted upon those involved were perhaps even more profound than the crime itself. The CCNY Beavers, the greatest college basketball organization on the planet, cancelled their entire athletics program, only to return 10 years later as a D3 team, which they remain to this day. LIU also shut down their athletics program. It would take them 30 years to finally climb back up to being a D1 franchise, and they turned out much better than nearly every other team involved. Almost every other team suffered the same fate as CCNY. Either they are now D3 teams, or they don't even exist at all. The Kentucky Wildcats were the only team involved to survive the scandal, but even they were hit very hard. They were banned from the NCAA for the 1952-53 through 53 season, and their former players, many of which were NBA superstars at this point, were banned from the NBA for life. In total, nine NBA players were permanently banned, eight of which were banned on the same day. Since then, in the NBA's next 70 years of existence, only seven more players have ever faced this same punishment. Eight were banned in a day, and then seven were banned in 70 years. Countless NBA stars that should currently be household names, similar to the likes of Bill Russell, Wilt Chamberlain, or George Mikan, had their careers cut too short to even be remembered at all. Alex Groza averaged 23 and 11 in his first two NBA seasons and made two All-NBA teams, one All-Star team, won the NBA's first ever Rookie of the Year award, led the league in field goal percentage twice, and even put up 32 points and 14 rebounds in the 1951 playoffs, but you've never even heard of him because he was banned for life. Ralph Beard also had a short two-year NBA career. He was a one-time All-Star and put up 17, 4, and 5 in his second season. You should know his name, and you would've, but this scandal took him away. Some of the old-timers have told me that they believe he was the best guard ever for the first 50 years of the 20th century. I kiddingly say, and I, that he threw a pass one time and he ran over and caught it. He made a bad mistake and he's been paying for it for over four decades. In 1949, Beard, Groza, and a group of their Kentucky Wildcat friends bought a new NBA team called the Indianapolis Olympians and became player owners of the franchise. So when the scandal was busted, the entire team collapsed. Not only should Alex Groza, Ralph Beard, and all these other Kentucky players be NBA legends right now, but they should also be multi-multi-millionaires simply due to their ownership of the Olympians. This minuscule investment they made in the 40s would have been massive for them in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and still to this day. But after everything was taken away from them, they had to let go of the franchise. They'd still own the franchise that would be worth millions of dollars, and they would have made lots of money in the meantime. So that's, that uh, gambling deal of a thousand bucks or whatever they got was very, very dear. If Groza, Beard, and all the others don't get involved in point shaving, the Indianapolis Olympians are still an NBA team right now as we speak. The Pacers never come into existence, and instead, DeMontis Sabonis is currently rocking an Olympian uniform with Alex Groza's jersey hanging above him in the rafters. Oh yeah, and remember Harry Gross, the guy behind all this? Yeah, he got eight years in prison. That's it. What the fuck? Anyways, that's the story of the biggest scandal in NBA history. If you enjoyed it, be sure to subscribe down below. This one was a long one, and you did make it all the way to the end, so hey, just push the button, man. Let me know any thoughts you have in the comments below about this situation. I know it is extremely insane. And with that, as always, stay safe out there.